Good to be with you. I uh, uh, bring you greetings from the great state of Texas. Uh, Leslie and I moved down to the Houston area a year ago, and uh, I'm a teaching pastor of Woodlands Church down there, and we love Texas. You know, Texas uh, state is called the Lone Star State, which I always thought sounded pretty cool. And then uh, one Texas hater came up to me once. He said, yeah, you know why you call it the Lone Star State? I said, why? He said, that's its rating on Yelp. (laughs) So it's not, granted, it's not as beautiful as Southern California, but in the spring, we have that scent of petrochemicals in the air, and it's... (laughs) It's really kind of alluring, you know, it's kind of nice. No, actually, it's really, we, we love it down there, and uh, I bring you greetings from Woodlands Church. It is a church that uh, probably would not be in existence if it weren't for you, and uh, Rick and Kay and Tom and uh, uh, Holiday and Shondell and the staff here and congregation, how your church has encouraged Woodlands Church through the years. So every time someone comes to faith at Woodlands Church, as thousands of do, do every year, you're a link in that chain because you helped encourage the launching of that church. So as we Texans say, we appreciate you. <laughs> so I'm, I'm glad to be here, but actually I'm glad to be anywhere, uh, to be honest, after something that happened to me in Little Rock, Arkansas. Uh, I was down in Little Rock to speak at a charity event, and, and the pastor picks me up from the airport. And we're driving along, and he says, uh, yeah, I, I told a young woman in our church, I said, Lee Strobel's going to speak tonight. And she said, oh, the guy who wrote The Case for Christ, is he still living? <laughs> so I'm glad to be anywhere, um, but especially here among friends at Saddleback. And, and I love the title of this series uh, that we're in here called uh, Good News for a Change. I think that's a great title. I thought, well, what can I contribute to that series? And, and I thought, you know what? I'm, I'm just going to do something simple. I'm just going to tell you a story. It's a true story. It's my story. And it's a story that begins in atheism. Because I decided at a rather young age, initially as a, as a teenager that God does not and cannot exist. I I thought that God didn't create people, but people created God. Why? Because they were afraid of death. So they made up this idea of heaven to make themselves feel better about dying. That's what I thought. I mean, I just thought the mere concept of an all-loving and and an all-knowing and an all-powerful creator of the universe, come on, that's crazy, was not even worth my time to check out. Now, granted, I tend to be a skeptical person. My background's in journalism and law, so you can imagine, put those two things together, what kind of a jerk, or skeptic, sorry, (laughs) that you you get. I was legal editor of the Chicago Tribune newspaper, and we used to pride ourselves on our skepticism. We didn't want to accept anybody's word at face value. We always tried to get at least two sources to confirm a fact before we'd print it in the newspaper. So no kidding, we had a sign in our newsroom that said, if your mother says she loves you, check it out. (laughs) How do you know? Maybe she's lying. Got any proof? Got any evidence? But that's okay. You want newspaper people to be skeptical. You want journalists to have a degree of skepticism, right? That's good. That's healthy. But my problem was that my skepticism bubbled over into cynicism, and it cemented me into my atheism. Now, because I had no belief in God, I I really lacked a moral framework for my life. Now, I'm not saying that all atheists uh, think this way, but the way I looked at things, I tried to look rationally and logically, and I thought, well, okay, if there is no God, if there is no heaven, if there is no hell, if there is no judgment, if there is no ultimate accountability, then the most logical way for me to live my life would be as a hedonist, someone who just pursued pleasure and that's what I did and so I lived a very immoral and drunken and profane and narcissistic self-absorbed really self-destructive in a lot of ways kind of life that was that that was my life had a lot of rage inside of me, a lot of anger. And if he asked me back then, hey, what's the deal? Why the, why the rage? Why the anger? I, I couldn't have told you, but looking back, I can see now what it was. I was always after the perfect high. 
You know, I, I was always after, you know, that, that ultimate experience of pleasure. And guess what? Everything let me down. Nothing lived up to the hype. So I had a lot of anger, a lot of rage. I remember once my wife and I got in an argument and, and, and our little daughter was there and I had so much rage, I blew up and I remember I reared back and I kicked a hole right through our living room wall. And my daughter's crying and my wife's crying. And it's like, hey, that was my life. In fact, I'm gonna tell you the ugliest thing about me, which is when my little daughter, Allison, was just a toddler, if she was alone in the living room playing with some blocks, some toys or whatever, and she would hear me come home from work through the front door, her natural reaction was just to gather her toys and go in her room and shut the door. Is she going to be drunk again? Is she going to be yelling and screaming and kicking holes in walls? You know what? At least it's nice and quiet in here. Friends, that is the ugliest truth about me. My wife, Leslie, was agnostic. She didn't know what to think about God. And, and so one day, we moved into a condo outside Chicago. And the woman who lived downstairs, Linda, was a Christian. And she brought up a plate of cookies as we moved in. And she became best friends with my wife, Leslie. And it was very natural for Linda, because God was such an important part of her life. It was natural for her to talk about God to Leslie. And Leslie wasn't hostile toward this stuff. Nobody had ever told her this stuff before. So she asked questions, she went to church with her, she checked it out, and after many months of doing this, she came up to me one day and, and said, Lee, I made a big decision. I said, what? She said, I've decided to become a follower of Jesus Christ. And I thought, oh no. You know, for an atheist, this is the worst news you know, that you're gonna get. I, <laughs> I thought she was gonna turn into some holy roller or something. I mean, I, I didn't sign up for this. This wasn't part of the original deal. I mean, seriously, first word that went through my mind? divorce. I was just going to walk out. But I stuck around. And what really shocked me is in the following months, I, I saw positive changes in her character and in her values and the way she related to me and the children. And it was winsome and it was attractive. And so finally, one Sunday morning, I'm sleeping off a hangover. She's getting ready to go to church. And she looks at me and she says, Lee, why don't you come to church with me today? And I thought, you know what? I'm going to go. Get around this cult that she's involved in, you know. So, so I went with her to a church that was meeting in a movie theater about a mile from my house. And the pastor gets up to preach. And he was a young guy. I don't even think he was shaven yet. Uh, his name was Bill Hybels. And he gave a talk called Basic Christianity. And I remember sitting there as a skeptic, and it was like one after the other, he was knocking down my misconceptions about the Christian faith. And I remember walking out that day saying two things to myself. Number one, I was still an atheist. He did not convince me that day that God exists. But number two, I realized, if this stuff is true, this has huge implications for my life. You know, duh. So... So I decided that day, I'm going to take my legal training, I'm going to take my journalism training, and I'm going to systematically investigate, is there any credibility to Christianity or any other world religion? And I launched what turned out to be a nearly two-year investigation of the evidence. Now, as I began that investigation, one thing became very clear very quickly. And that is, if you want to get to the bottom line, is Christianity true and therefore, every other contrary faith system in the world false. If you want to get to that bottom line, all you have to do is answer one question. Did Jesus, or did he not, return from the dead? That's the ballgame. Why? Because in a variety of different ways, explicitly and implicitly, Jesus made transcendent and messianic and divine claims about himself. He claimed to be the Son of God. Um, in fact, at one point, he got up before a group and he said, I and the Father are one. And the word in Greek there for one is not masculine, it's neuter, which means Jesus was not saying, I and the Father are the same person. He was saying, I and the Father are the same thing. We're one in nature. We're one in essence. And how did the audience understand what he was saying? Well, they picked up stones to kill him because they said, they said, you, a mere man, you're claiming to be God. So Jesus claimed to be the Son of God, but so what? I could claim to be the Son of God. Rick could claim to be the Son of God. Anybody can make that claim. 
But if Jesus claimed to be the son of God, died, and then three days later rose from the dead, that's pretty good evidence he's telling the truth, right? I mean, that's why the resurrection is the linchpin of the Christian faith. It's why the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 17, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You're still in your sins. In other words, the resurrection of Jesus is the ball game. So what I want to do for the next few minutes is I just want to hit some of the highlights of the investigation I did on the resurrection of Jesus. Um, And frankly, it's become now a lifelong investigation. And I want to do it by using four words that begin with the letter E. That way it's easy to remember, and if you're kind of checking out the faith, you know, maybe this will help crystallize some things, or if you're a follower of Jesus, then I hope you will pray that sometime between now and Easter, God might bring someone into your life and the opportunity to share these four E's with them. That when I did my investigation, I did not give the Bible any special credibility. I didn't consider it to be inerrant, inspired, the word of God. I do now, but I was a skeptic then. But I had to accept the New Testament for what it undeniably is, which is a set of ancient historical writings. And I knew, just as you can investigate any ancient writings, whether they're by Josephus or Tacitus or Suetonius, you can take those same investigative techniques and apply them to the documents of the New Testament to try to determine, are they telling me the truth? So in other words, I didn't just open the Bible and says, oh, Jesus was resurrected, end of story. I wanted to dig beneath that. How do I know it really happened? So what is the evidence that Jesus rose from the dead and thus proved that he is who he claimed to be? Well, the four E's start this way. The first E stands for the word execution. You gotta have a death, right, before you can have a resurrection. And what I found very quickly in my investigation is there is no dispute among scholars in the field about the execution of Jesus Christ under Pontius Pilate. It is just not in dispute. And I don't mean just among Christian scholars. I'm talking about the wide range of scholarship. There is virtual unanimity around the planet on this issue. Why? Because when we study ancient history, we're lucky if we have one or, or maybe two sources to confirm a fact. And yet, for the execution of Jesus by crucifixion under Pontius Pilate, we not only have multiple early first century accounts of this in the documents that make up the New Testament, we've also got five ancient sources outside the Bible confirming and corroborating his execution. We have Josephus, a first century Jewish historian who worked for the Romans. Tacitus, another early historian. Lucian, Mer- Barserapian. Even the Jewish Talmud admits that Jesus was executed. This is so well established of an historical fact, you would get laughed out of a major academic institution if you somehow claim, no, 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 Jesus didn't get executed. In fact, the evidence is so convincing that you can go to an atheist New Testament scholar like Gerd Ludeman of Vanderbilt University, and, um, and he will tell you this about what the evidence is. Quote, Jesus' death as a consequence of crucifixion is indisputable. Indisputable. Now, I don't know how much you've studied ancient history, but there are very few facts in ancient history that a critical, skeptical, atheist historian like a Gerd Ludeman will say is indisputable. One of them is the execution of Jesus. The first E is for execution. Jesus was dead. The second E, I think, is the most fascinating. It stands for the word early. We have early accounts or early reports that Jesus rose from the dead. In other words, reports that come virtually immediately after his execution. Why is that important? Because like a lot of skeptics, I used to think that the resurrection of Jesus was merely a legend. And I knew it took time for legend to develop in the ancient world. So I figured 100, 150, 200 years after the life of Jesus, legends began to develop. Stories began to be invented. Mythologies began to be spun. Oh, there was this Jesus. Really? Oh, yeah, great guy. Lived in the first century. Really? Oh, yeah. You know, he rose from the dead. Seriously? Oh, yeah. And they, they, I thought they just kind of made this stuff up. But what I learned, I think, decimates the claim 
that the resurrection is merely a legend. Follow me on this. I think this is fascinating. We have preserved for us a creed, a statement of conviction of the earliest church. In other words, the first century Christians rallied around this creed based on facts that they knew to be true. Now this creed summarizes the resurrection and the essentials of Christianity. Now the Apostle Paul preserves it for us in a letter that he wrote to the church in Corinth. We call this letter 1 Corinthians. And this creed is found in 1 Corinthians 15, starting at verse 3. Let me read you what it says. Paul writes, For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. Now let's stop there. This is technical rabbinic language. This is a rabbi or a teacher would use this language when he's saying, look, I am taking this sacred tradition, this creed, and it's so important. I'm not going to mess with it. I just want to turn and pass it on to you. And notice he said, notice he said, uh, I passed it on. So previously, on a previous visit, he had already passed on this creed, but he's going to repeat it in this letter. So what does the creed say? That Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep, and some have died. Let's stop there. So what they're saying is, look, you don't believe us? about the resurrection, there's 500 people who are eyewitnesses. Go talk to them. They're still living. They're still around. Then it goes on. Then he appeared to James. Stop there. James was a skeptic about Jesus during Jesus' lifetime. And yet, he ends up dying, being executed as a leader of the church. What changed him from skeptic to leader of the church? The resurrected Jesus, it said, appeared to him. And then it says he appeared to all the apostles. And then Paul adds, and last of all, he appeared to me also. Now, this report of the resurrection, naming eyewitnesses and groups of eyewitnesses, what's important is how immediately this developed after the death of Jesus. Remember we said it took time for legend to develop, right? Okay. Dr. Gary Habermas, a historian in this area who I interviewed for my book, The Case for Christ, uh, has developed this timeline to help us understand how early this creed developed. We know historically that Paul wrote this letter to the church in Corinth within 22 to 25 years of the death of Jesus. And he says he passed on this creed earlier. So sometime before then, let's say 20 years after the death of Jesus, this creed was already in existence. Now, if we stop there, that would, that would be pretty impressive anyway, 20 years between the event and, and the creed. Because when you think about it, the first two biographies of Alexander the Great by Arian and Plutarch were written 400 years after his life, and they're generally considered reliable. So 20 years or so is pretty impressive, but we can go back earlier than that. Because Paul used to be Saul of Tarsus, a persecutor, a hater of Christians. One to three years after the death of Jesus, he's on the road to Damascus. Boom, he has this encounter with the risen Christ. He becomes the apostle Paul. Immediately, he goes into Damascus and he meets with some apostles. There are scholars who believe this was when he was given this creed that he later writes to the church in Corinth. But others say, no, 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 it was probably three years later. Three years later, Paul goes to Jerusalem and meets for 15 days with two people specifically named in the creed, Peter and James. And the Greek word that Paul uses to describe this meeting, historio, suggests that this was not a meeting where they were talking about the weather or about baseball or something. They were talk- it was an investigative inquiry. What do you know? What did you see? What did you- They're checking each other out. They're- And most scholars will say this was when he was given the creed by two people named in the creed. But either way, it means within one to six years after the death of Jesus, this creed is already in existence, and therefore the beliefs that make up that creed go back even earlier virtually to the cross itself. So the point is there is no huge time gap between the death of Jesus and this belief, this conviction, this report that he rose from the dead. We got a newsflash that goes right back to the beginning. In fact, one of the great 
scholars in this area, uh, James D.G. Dunn, writes this. This tradition, and by this tradition he means this creed. This tradition, we can be entirely confident, was formulated as a creed, as tradition, within months of Jesus' death. Within months. Friends, this is historical gold. It would be unprecedented in the history of the world for a legend to develop that fast and wipe out a solid core of historical truth. In fact, one of the greatest historians who ever lived, A.N. Sherwin White of Oxford, he studied the rate at which legend developed in the ancient world. And he determined that the passage of two generations of time is not even enough for legend to grow up and wipe out a solid core of historical truth. We don't have two generations of time passing here. We got a newsflash that goes right back to the beginning. And it's not the um, only early report we've got. We've got others right there from the first century, from Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the book of Acts, other writings of Paul, all of which date back so early they were circulating during the lifetimes of Jesus' contemporaries who would have been all too happy to point out the errors if they were making this stuff up. Friends, we got an execution. Jesus was dead. We've got reports of his resurrection that come so early, so immediately after the event, you can't just write them off as saying they're legend. But that's not all we've got. We've got a third E, stands for the word empty. We have an empty tomb. The historical record tells us that Jesus' body was placed in a tomb belonging to Joseph of, Arimath uh, Joseph of Arimathea, a member of the Jewish council. It was sealed. Matthew tells us it was guarded, and yet it was discovered empty on that first Easter morning. Now, we could spend the rest of the day talking about all the strands of historical evidence that established that the tomb was empty. But I'm just going to give you one fact, because to me, this is conclusive. And that's this. Even the enemies of Jesus implicitly admitted that the tomb of Jesus was empty. How do we know? Because when the disciples began proclaiming that Jesus had risen, what the opponents of Jesus never said was, baloney, go open the tomb, you'll find the body. That's all they needed to say because it would have put the onus on the disciples to prove it. But they didn't say that. What did they say? Well, we know from sources inside and outside the New Testament that when the disciples began proclaiming that Jesus had risen from the dead, what the opponents said was, oh, well, um, the disciples stole the body. Now think about that. What is that? That's a cover story. They're implicitly conceding the tomb is empty, but they're trying to explain how it got empty by blaming it on the disciples. See what I'm saying? It's like if you're a teacher and a student comes up to you and says, the dog ate my homework. That student is implicitly admitting, look, I don't have my homework. But I can explain what happened to it. The dog ate it. It's the same thing. So either implicitly or explicitly, the enemies, the supporters of Jesus are all conceding that the tomb was empty. I don't think that was the issue of history. I think the issue of history really is, how did it get empty? And you go through the usual list of suspects. The Romans weren't about to steal the body. They wanted Jesus dead. The religious leaders of the day weren't about to steal the body. They wanted Jesus to stay dead. The disciples weren't about to steal the body. They didn't have the motive. They didn't have the means. And they didn't have the opportunity. I think the best explanation for the tomb of Jesus being empty is that he rose from the dead, especially when we combine it with the fourth word that begins with the letter E, which is the word eyewitnesses. Not only was Jesus' tomb discovered empty, but over a period of time, Jesus appears alive in a dozen different instances to more than 515 people, to skeptics and opponents and doubters as well as to believers, to men, to women, indoors, outdoors, daytime, nighttime, to groups, to individuals. People talk with them. They touched him. They ate with them. I mean, think of this. Remember we said we're lucky in ancient history if we have one or maybe two sources to confirm a fact? Well, get this. For the conviction of the disciples that they encountered the resurrected Jesus, we have no fewer than nine ancient sources inside and outside the New Testament 
confirming and corroborating their conviction that they encountered the risen Christ. That is an avalanche of historical data. And it changed the disciples. Changed them from being cowards and afraid that they were going to get executed, hiding. And history shows us that just a short time later, in the very same city where Jesus was put to death, these once cowardly disciples are now proclaiming with boldness that Jesus not only claimed to be the Son of God, he backed it up by returning from the dead. And we have seven ancient sources inside and outside the New Testament that tell us that they lived lives of deprivation and suffering as a result of that proclamation. Why were they willing to do that? Not because they just had faith that Jesus rose from the dead. Not because someone told them it was true. Not because they heard it in the radio. Not because a Sunday school teacher told them. But because of all the human beings who've ever lived, they were in a position to know for a fact whether Jesus had appeared from the dead or whether it was a lie. And knowing it was true, they were willing to suffer for their proclamation that he had risen. That tells me something about the sincerity of their convictions. Friends, I spent two years of my life investigating the minutiae of the resurrection of Jesus. And it all came down to a Sunday afternoon. And I remember I went alone in my bedroom. And I thought, you know, a, a good jury reaches a verdict. And I'd been stuffing my head for two years with all this data, all, with all this evidence. And I thought, I got to reach a verdict. I got to reach a conclusion. How do I do that? So I, I decided to take a yellow legal pad. And I thought, I'm just going to write out in longhand the, you know, a summary of the evidence, pro and con, everything that I've seen in two years. Just get it down on paper. So I started writing page after page after page after page after page after page. And finally, I put down my pen and I said, well, wait a second. In light of the avalanche of evidence that points so powerfully toward the truth of Christianity, I realized it would take more faith for me to maintain my atheism than to become a Christian. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. So for me, I concluded based on the evidence of history that Jesus not only claimed to be the Son of God, he backed it up by returning from the dead. And then I felt very let down. I, it was very anticlimactic. Because here I'd spent two years doing this, and it's like, okay, should there not be an earthquake about now? You know, a lightning maybe or something? Or It was like, is that all it is? And then I remembered a Christian had pointed out a verse to me earlier. So I got the Bible. I looked it up. John 1, 12. It says, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. And I said, okay, now I'm getting somewhere. I, I, I looked at that verse and I thought, you know, if you look at the key words, they form an equation of what it means to become a child of God. Believe plus receive equals become. So I said, okay, I, I get it now. I believe based on the evidence that Jesus is the son of God, but I realized that is not enough. I had to receive. Receive what? Receive this free gift of forgiveness and eternal life that Jesus purchased on the cross when he died as my substitute to pay for all of my sin. And when I would receive this free gift of his grace, then I would become a child of God. So I got on my knees next to my bed and I poured out a confession of a lifetime of immorality that would absolutely curl your hair. And at that moment, I received complete and total forgiveness through Jesus Christ and I became a child of God. And my very first thought, I, I got up off my knees and, and, and my first thought was, um, hey, I probably should tell Leslie about this. You know? <laughs> I didn't know. I figured she'd want to know. So I walked out of our bedroom and I walked down the hallway and I looked into the kitchen and there was Leslie standing behind the kitchen sink. But remember I mentioned my daughter, Allison? She was almost five years old by then. And she was standing in front of Leslie on her tiptoe, stretched out, and for the first time she was able to touch the faucet. So I walked down the hallway, I looked in the kitchen, Allison said, Daddy, Daddy, look, look, I can touch it, I can reach it. 
I said, wow, you're really getting big. She ran off. And I turned to Leslie and I said, honey, that's how I feel. So I, I, I feel like for the last two years of my life, I've been reaching out and reaching out. I just touched Jesus. He is alive. He is resurrected. He's the son of God. I just gave him my life. And she looked at me. And she looked at me and, and she burst into tears. And she threw her arms around my neck and she said, you hard-hearted son of a Baptist, I've been telling you this for two years, hello. <laughs> no, I'm kidding, she didn't do that. <laughs> I always wish she had done that because that would have made a great story. That would have been hilarious. But that's not Leslie. She burst into tears and she threw her arms around my neck and she said, oh honey, I almost gave up on you a thousand times. She said, when I was a new Christian, I met some women at church, and I told them about you. I said, I don't have any hope for my husband. He is the hard-headed, hard-hearted legal editor of the Chicago Tribune. He will never bend his knee to Jesus Christ. And she said, this one elderly saint put her arm around her shoulders, kind of pulled her off to the side, and she said, oh, Leslie, no one is beyond hope. And she gave her a verse from the Old Testament. Ezekiel 36, 26. It says, moreover, I will give you a new heart and I will put a new spirit within you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and I will give you a heart of flesh. And what I never knew, that whole two years that I'm on this investigative journey, what I never knew was behind the scenes every day, Leslie was on her knees praying that verse for me. And can I tell you what happened? Starting on that Sunday afternoon, now that I was adopted as a child of God, and as I was over time then, as I was baptized, as I became part of a vibrant church, as I, as I learned to read the Bible with fresh eyes, as I learned to worship, as I learned to pray, God began to answer her prayers because my values changed and my character changed. And my morality changed. And my philosophy and my worldview and my attitudes and my priorities and my relationships and my marriage and my parenting. I mean, all these things over time began to change for the good. So much so that our daughter, Allison, and think about this for a second. Here's a little girl, five years old. All she knew for the first five years of her life was a dad who was absent, angry, kicking holes in walls, coming home drunk. That was her whole life experience for those first five years. But starting on that Sunday afternoon, you know what she did? She started to watch. Something's changing with dad. Something's different with dad. Something's new with dad. She never, entered, uh, never uh, studied ancient history you know, never interviewed an archaeologist. She's just five, but she could watch, she could listen, she could observe, and she did. And she watched for, I don't know, four or five, six months until one Sunday morning. And she went up to her Sunday school teacher and then up to Leslie. And you know what she said? I want God to do for me what he's done for daddy. So at age five, my little girl received this free gift of God's grace. And today she's married to a seminary graduate. She's a novelist. She has half a dozen novels, works of fiction that she has written that have been published and they all have the message of Jesus woven into them. Together, her and her husband write children's books about God. She is the mother of two of my four precious grandchildren. And we're the best of friends. And same for my son. My son saw the difference God was making in his mom and his dad and his sister, and he came to faith at a young age too, but he took an academic route, and he got an undergraduate degree in biblical studies, and he got a master's degree in philosophy of religion. Then he got another master's degree in New Testament. And then after many years of research and study at Yale University and at the University of Aberdeen in Scotland, he was awarded his PhD in theology. And today, you know what he does? 
He's a professor at the Talbot School of Theology at Biola University in Southern California, where he teaches young people about Jesus Christ. And two years ago, his wife gave birth to our first grandson. And he named him after his dad. Friends, God changed our family. He changed my son. He changed my daughter. He changed my wife. He changed me. And now Leslie and I just celebrated our 43rd wedding anniversary together. So that's my story. That's my story. So what do you do with that? Let me, um, let me just end by applying that story to you. Let's go back to that equation. Believe plus receive equals become. And I just want to be as honest as I can with you. You know, you may have come here today because a friend invited you, and we're so glad you came. You are so welcome here. But if the honest truth were known, you do not yet believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And I want to say to you, if you do not believe that, that's fine. That's perfectly okay. As long as you do what I did and you check it out. Do your own investigation. I mean, the Old Testament and the New Testament both say, if you sincerely seek God, guess what? You're going to find him. So seek him. If my books are helpful, great. This is a great church to come to, to investigate and to go on that journey. I met an atheist here last night. Nice guy. We had a wonderful conversation afterwards. He said, I'm going to dedicate the next year of my life to seriously and intensely investigating the evidence. Would you be willing to do that? I'd encourage you to make this a front burner issue in your life. And resolve at the outset when you get enough evidence that you'll reach a verdict. But then let me end with this. Some of you believe, but you've never received. I mean, you believe the right stuff. That's great. That's fantastic. But honestly, your kids have not seen a difference in you. Why is it you come to a church like this and you hear people talk about they have a, how they have a deep and a, a vibrant and a real and authentic relationship with Jesus? And you hear this and in the back of your mind you're thinking, why is that not like that with me? Why does God seem so distant from me? Could it be because you believe the right stuff and that's great, but there's never been a point in time where you have received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Friends, I'm just asking the question. If you're not sure if you've ever done that and you want to, let's do it. Let's not wait. Let's make today the day we can mark on the calendar that I know I become a child of God. I believe and I've received and I have become. So let's just close our eyes and bow our heads. And if you want to take that step, I'm not going to ask you to do anything weird. You know, just in your heart, say this. God will hear you. Just in your heart, say, Lord Jesus, as best I can, I do believe that you are the Son of God. And I confess to you that I am a sinner. And I want to turn from that. And in an attitude of repentance and faith, I want to receive this gift of grace that you offer. Thank you for enduring the torture of the cross so that we could be reconciled forever. Help me to live the kind of life you want me to live because from this moment on, I am yours. And now, Father, we know from Luke 15 that a party breaks out in heaven every time a sinner repents, receives forgiveness through your son. So we celebrate with them. And we pray for those that are still on the journey that have questions and doubts and obstacles in the way. We pray by your spirit you would use this church, you would use the books, whatever. Use friends to help them resolve 
the spiritual sticking points that are holding them up so that someday we can celebrate their rebirth as well. And then finally, Father, for those of us who are your followers and maybe for a long, long time, we thank you for the privilege, the honor of being part of a church that is like a city on a hill that shines your message of hope and grace and forgiveness and redemption and justice and eternal life and shines that message all over planet Earth. Thank you for the privilege of being part of that. We pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's people agreed and said, Amen.